very much. Uh, yeah, my name is Scott Levi, and I'm here to produce uh, to to introduce my colleague Peter Mansour, who is a professor of history and the general Raymond Mason Chair in military history. Pete started his career at West Point uh, as a as a as a young student, and then gradually made his way through and earned a PhD in history right here from uh, Ohio State University. He served a career in the U.S. Army, rose to the rank of colonel before we uh, enticed him to retire and return to OSU. Uh, that was in 2008. Uh, Pete and I joined the, the same year, me from another university and uh, Pete from Iraq. Uh, in addition to his many articles, chapters, and edited volumes, Pete's the author of three books, The GI Offensive in Europe, The Triumph of American Infantry Divisions, 1941 to 45, then Baghdad at Sunrise, A Brigade Commander's War in Iraq, and then finally Surge, My Journey, journey with General David Petraeus and the Remaking of the Iraq War. Uh, I'll only note additionally that Pete is currently serving as president of the Society for Military History. I'm afraid if I keep going, working through all of his uh, achievements, we'll, we'll run out of time. So I'll stop here and uh, pass the mic over to Greg. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, I'm Greg Caldera, Chair of the Department of Political Science, and I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Chris Jelpe, who is director of the Mershon Center for International Security Studies, chair of Peace Studies uh, and Conflict Resolution, and professor in the Department of Political Science. He is, his research interests focus on peace, uh, the resolution of conflict, and the internationalization of military conflicts. He is the author of many books on those subjects, uh, a whole raft of articles, and uh, a very distinguished scholar. And with no further ado, uh, I will turn our discussion over to our main speakers, Peter and Chris, with Peter going first. OK, well, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Greg, for those kind introductions. Um, we're going to take a, just a few minutes up front to, to frame uh, why we lost uh, the Afghan war and, and what, what we do now uh, going forward. Uh, and I would point to four major uh, issues with our war in Afghanistan. Uh, the first is we lost sight of the objective. We went into Afghanistan to destroy Al Qaeda, to punish it for the attacks of 9-11 on the United States. And by 2002, um, we had toppled the Taliban government, which refused to give up Al Qaeda leaders for prosecution. Uh, but we had not destroyed Al Qaeda. They uh, withdrew into the mountains in the eastern part of the country. And instead of using uh, US ground forces to root them out of their caves and so forth, which would have been bloody and, and very difficult, but uh, was perhaps possible, uh, at the time, General James Mattis was a brigade commander uh, of a Marine Expeditionary uh, Brigade in Kandahar and, and volunteered to have his troops go up into Tora Bora into the mountains there and, and fight Al Qaeda. We instead relied on air power and local militias to do the job, and they did not. Uh, Al Qaeda retreated across the border into the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan. And of course, as we know, um, Osama bin Laden ended up uh, in a house in, in Abbottabad, which is the uh, home of the Pakistani Military Academy, whether the Pakistani Inter Services Intelligence uh, Agency had any sort of um, a role in that still remains unknown, <clears throat> or at least it's classified, um, but I would say it's probably likely. Um, and so at that point, what was our objective? Well. Our, our target was across the border now, and instead we turned this, uh, this operation into an exercise in nation building. Um, we held the Loya Jirga and formed a new Afghan government, which was very, very centralized, unlike uh, previous governments in Afghanistan. And then we proceeded to try to remake Afghanistan into a modern society, a modern democracy with a capitalist uh, economic system. And um, as we found over 20 years, uh, that was difficult, if not impossible to do. And we, we just got wrapped up in this new mission, which was not the original mission with very little discussion 
as to why we were doing it. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing <clears throat> I think dovetails on that, and that is we lacked a local, a viable local partner. Um, if you look at how counterinsurgencies are won historically, they're normally won when you have uh, a viable host nation partner, and then you can add US capabilities or Western capabilities to help that local partner defeat the insurgency. Uh, I think the gold standard of this would be the uh, defeat of the Huck Rebellion in the Philippines in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, when you had a, a Filipino government that under Ramon Magsasay that was uh, um, you know, pretty forthcoming and actually was interested in taking care of its people. And so we added US capabilities to that and defeated the Hucks. We were not really able to find that local partner in Afghanistan. The tribal militia, the tribal units didn't um, turn against uh, the Taliban the way the awakening, uh, Sunni awakening turned against Al Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, the uh, government in Kabul was fairly corrupt and, um, and not welcome. Uh, by the various uh, populations in the provinces. And the, like I said, the form of government was very, very centralized. So the president of Afghanistan would appoint governors rather than have them be elected by popular ballot. And so they didn't really represent uh, the local area with any sort of legitimacy. And I think as we, we have discovered, uh, the Afghan people were not all in in supporting this government in Kabul when um, after we left. The third thing is uh, geography. Geography matters, and it matters for a couple of reasons. One is the Taliban, which was thoroughly defeated in 2002, was able to go across the border into Pakistan and regenerate, and we weren't able to do anything about it. We didn't have a viable partner in the Pakistani government. I think if you go to the dictionary and look up the, the definition of a frenemy, there's a picture of a map of Afghanistan, of Pakistan there. Uh, and maybe at one of Turkey as well. Um, and so the, the Taliban was able to regenerate, uh, re make good its losses, and probably get weapons and supplies and funding uh, via uh, the inner services intelligence agencies in, uh, in Pakistan and probably uh, uh, great powers as well, such as Russia. <clears throat> um, and so we could never De destroy the Taliban after 2002 because it simply could retreat across the border if the going got too rough, as it did during the surge of 2009 and 2010. Um, the other part of, of geography was the logistics of providing the wherewithal for a major operation in a landlocked country surrounded by <clears throat> really problematic uh, countries was daunting uh, at best. We had to buy off the Pakist Pakistanis to, to get logistics up through um, Pakistan, or we eventually created a northern distribution network which ran either through Russia or through the, the stands. Um, and those also proved to be very problematic logistics routes for a variety of reasons. So this was not an easy place to fight. Um, and finally, uh, we passed over opportunities to negotiate. Uh, I've asked many, many people who are smarter on Afghanistan uh, than me, or, or at least had more um, intimate dealings with the, the war. And I said, is there any point at which we could have uh, won or we could have negotiated with the Taliban to end the conflict? And I think there were two points. One was in 2002 when the Taliban had been defeated. Now, it would have taken a lot of foresight for the Bush administration to say, you know, yeah, you, you housed Al Qaeda, uh, you gave them sanctuary and we've just defeated you, but we really need you to be part of the solution to governing Afghanistan going forward, let's negotiate. Um, at that point, they might've been able to. Uh, the other possibility was during the surge of 2009 to 2010 or 11, when we injected a lot of military forces into Afghanistan, and they did uh, a fairly robust counterinsurgency operation, albeit one that was not fully resourced. Um, the problem with negotiating with the Taliban then, even though we sort of had them on their heels, 
is President Obama announced that the surge was not open-ended, that it would in fact um, end within 18 months and we would withdraw those forces, uh, giving the Taliban really no reason to negotiate. They could simply wait us out, which is exactly what they did. Um, and with that, um, I look forward to uh, discussion on other aspects of the war coming up, but I will turn it over to Chris for his thoughts. Thanks so much, and um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm looking forward to our discussion. I'm, I'm a little concerned that we won't disagree with each other enough because I actually agree with everything that Pete just had to say. Um, uh, but I want to um, I'll, I'll start with which po which points in particular I would emphasize, and then maybe move on from there. Um, it seemed going back to Pete's first point. Um, while while I agree that. Um, failure for America in Afghanistan was overdetermined that we had so many different causes coming together. Um, I would really emphasize um, the first and second uh, points that, that Pete made uh, as sort of crucial moments where um, once we did these things, there, there was not going to be a, a good result. And that is the shift to the kind of state building mission in combination with a lack of any real local partner um, who could who could be the kinds of institutions that would have any staying power? Um, as soon as we did that back in 2002, um, there was not going to be a good result, I think. And so, um, in that sense, uh, this where we are today is not a surprise. Um, what is a surprise is how long it took us to get here, and how costly it was for us to get here, and. Um, and that it took that long and, and cost that much, despite the fact that I think it should have been pretty clear to policymakers for quite some time uh, that this wasn't going to have a, a good result. And so one of the things that's really curious to me about Afghanistan or puzzling is it is the, the way in which our policymakers did not learn from history, did not learn from our experiences in Vietnam. Um, did not learn from previous government's experiences in Afghanistan, did not learn from, uh, and Pete maybe have more, may have more to say this as well, but did not learn from our um, experiences about what worked and what didn't work in Iraq, and did not uh, apply those things uh, well. And, and frankly, I find it shocking that so much blood and treasure was lost um, without thinking about all of these lessons that were um, that were readily available to us, um, and so I think you know uh, I think all both Democratic and Republican leaders have uh, have something to be held to account for for what is really um, uh, a tragic waste of uh, so many human and material resources. Um, with that said, that that I think things were not going to end well uh, from all the way back in 2002, it was clear that things weren't going to end well. I do think that they probably ended even more poorly than they needed to uh, through some decisions of uh, recent decisions of the Biden administration. Most of what has gone wrong in Afghanistan, I would not hang on Joe Biden, um, but uh, the way in which there was such a rush to uh, to, to follow through with this by the September 11th deadline um, and to imagine that that could be done with so little preparation, so little attention paid to this prior to the, uh, the attempt to withdraw that uh, and the refusal to even consider, say, staying a few extra months so we could uh, try to sort out who we wanted to get out of Afghanistan. Um, as we were talking before we came on, um, uh, I noted to Pete that, uh, that Pete had told me that we actually got more people out of Kabul than we got out of Saigon, um, but he rightly noted that it's not clear that we got the right people out of Kabul um, because there was so much rush. And, and I think that really is part, uh, largely a political decision by the, uh, the Biden administration that I think was a pretty poor one. But also I think some, some pretty poor tactical decisions in, in the final moments um, uh, by US military leaders in, in Central Command um, as, as uh, Afghanistan was starting to fall. Um, in terms of where, where we go from here in Afghanistan, 
Um, I know there's a lot of concern about what are the um, what are the sort of shock waves that are going to follow from this in terms of American foreign policy and American diplomacy. Um, and uh, honestly, I don't really expect very much uh, impact to to come to American foreign policy. I'll be curious to know whether Pete um, agrees with that or not. But I think that American failure in uh, Afghanistan has been priced into uh, people's evaluations of American behavior for quite some time now. And so um, I don't think this is anything that's especially um, surprising to anyone. Moreover, I would say um, most other countries in the world don't construe the sorts of lessons that they learn from conflicts like Afghanistan very broadly. So I don't think the Russias and the Chinas of the world look to how the United States behaves in Afghanistan in order to figure out how we're going to behave in that rivalry. So I don't worry too much about sort of great power consequences um, from, from this. For me, the real question that, that is lingering coming out of Afghanistan, and, and I'll end on this point, is, is I wonder whether we will actually finally this time learn the lessons that we could have and should have learned from Vietnam, from other states' experiences in Afghanistan, from Iraq, about the limitations of American ability to intervene, particularly guided by the two things Pete mentioned earlier, which is um, not trying to do state building when we don't have a local partner. And uh, I, I think the best thing that we can do from, Afghan do from Afghanistan is to learn that lesson and not repeat that mistake another time. And with that, I'll end there. And I would welcome um, questions and discussion. Look yeah, let me, just, let me just let uh, me just uh, talk to two of the issues that you brought up. One is I agree with you. I think you know Afghanistan. There weren't a lot of um, U.S. equities involved there in Central Asia. There were some. I mean, we don't want to see Afghanistan used as a terrorist base in the future. Um, and you know, India really matters more than any other nation in that region for us and our withdrawal from Afghanistan has some impact on that. But I think that powers around the world are gonna look at the United States and you're gonna realize that we have uh, far more national security stakes involved in the South China Sea or in the, the Baltic states than we, do, than we did in Afghanistan. Uh, so this will have a short-term impact uh, especially on our NATO allies, because we didn't do a good job in, in reading them into the withdrawal either. And so they are a little bit miffed at us for that, uh, but they'll get over it. I mean, they really have no choice other than uh, to have the United States as an ally, unless they want to embrace uh, the Russian bear, which I doubt will be the case. Uh, the other thing um, is on the, the evacuation. I indeed, uh, in Vietnam, we evacuated about 50,000 people. In the final two nights, we evacuated 7,000. We evacuated 123,000 in two weeks out of Kabul. This is something the American military does really well, logistics. Um, the, the problem is, as you noted, is you know who, who knows if we got the right people out. There's a lot of uh, special visa applicants who um, remain in Afghanistan and probably will never get out. Uh, there were probably some people who got onto our airplanes, even though there was an attempt to vet them. Uh, there were State Department people there at the airport, you know, looking, looking them up on terrorist databases and so forth. But there's probably some people there who don't deserve necessarily to, to uh, have gotten a seat. Um, if this had been done over a longer period of time, it could have been done better. Now, there are several reasons for that. One is no one expected uh, the Kabul government to fall as quickly as it did. And this is the real um, collapse of our intelligence system. Uh, no one in, in, who was advising the president, at least no one we know, or at least no one who could convince him, uh, convinced anyone that the, the government in Kabul would, would collapse in a matter of just weeks after our, our withdrawal, uh, rather than remain uh, in power over months or maybe even a year or two. So we thought we had more time than we actually did. As a result, there were two decisions made. One is the military, when they were given the order to withdraw, told the president, okay, we're no longer in here to win, we're in here to withdraw, therefore force protection is paramount. And for force protection reasons, we need to withdraw as rapidly as we can. 
because that will mean the fewest U.S. soldiers that get targeted. And so they got out quick, including giving up um, uh, Bagram Air, Air, Airfield and uh, other places, and sometimes even without the, the Afghan security forces knowing what was happening. Uh, and that was successful. I mean, if, you, if the mission is to withdraw military forces, we did that uh, at the A-plus level. Uh, but of course, then we lacked an airhead after that to withdraw uh, people friendly to us, especially when all of the government centers started to fall, ending with uh, K Kabul itself. Um, and so the, the other thing is that uh, the Biden administration says that the Ashraf Ghani, the president of Afghanistan, said, don't withdraw, don't take all these uh, special visa applicants and others out too quickly because people will think it's a rush to the exits and my, my, my government will be un undermined by that. Um, and so that was another uh, thing that the administration had on its mind. But of course, if the administration had been better advised, um, as some people you know, did believe that once uh, we left, the Afghan security forces wouldn't last very long, then it would have made different decisions in terms of evacuating uh, those people who had those Afghans who had worked so uh, hard uh, to make the mission over 20 years a success. Um, let me put up a couple of questions. Uh, one is why was the intelligence so far off when in retrospect it seems that the government would not was not going to last for very long? And second, to what extent did the Trump administration's the deal they struck constrained the Biden administration. And it might be worth mentioning just what the Trump administration did negotiate. Well, the Trump administration negotiated a withdrawal of all US forces by May 1st uh, of this year. So what the Biden administration did was extend that deadline to first September 11th and then August 31st. Um, you know, the, what the Trump administration did did not tie Joe Biden's hands any more than uh, the Obama administration's um, nuclear pact with Iran tied the Trump administration's hand because it, it wasn't a pact that was confirmed by the Senate. So uh, the Biden administration could have said, no, we're staying. But that was not in Joe Biden's DNA. He had wanted us out of Afghanistan as early as 2010, 2011 when he was vice president. Uh, so I just don't see that in the cards. He wanted to get out. Um, he wanted to get out before he even became president. And this was his opportunity to do so. Um, the other thing on, on the intelligence, I think I, I've mentioned already, um, there were several reasons why the Afghan security forces collapsed so quickly. We created them in our own image and they were heavily reliant on centralized logistics, especially uh, air delivered uh, uh, logistics of ammunition and supplies and so forth. But when we, we withdrew, you know, we withdrew our drone network, which provided close air support for those forces. We, um, the only logistics uh, that remained were uh, Afghan Air Force C-130s and uh, Super, Super Tucano uh, planes and, and whatnot. And, but when we withdrew, we withdrew the 30,000 contractors that made those uh, planes functional. And so over, over a period pretty quickly, uh, the planes deteriorated. They weren't able to get the ammunition and uh, air support that needed to the troops in contact. And the Afghan security forces actually did fight uh, until they ran out of ammunition. And then they cut a deal to surrender. Mm -hmm. um, and it's beyond me why no one in the military chain could see that that would happen. Um, the other thing would be, um, I think we, there's a question in there about, you know, don't we read Afghan history? Uh, clearly we do not, because what happened as the Taliban started to gain ground is a lot of leaders decided it was better to fight another day than to fight it out to the end. And they cut deals with the Taliban. And that I'm sure uh, uh, Scott Levi will tell us is part of Afghan history. And, um, and no one could see that coming because you know we lacked, even for being there for 20 years, we lacked an intimate knowledge of that country. 
Chris, you want to weigh in on this? Um, so I will, the one, the one thing, I mean, I agree with what Pete said. Um, I, uh, uh, the, and, and I do think it really was a dramatic intelligence failure. I mean, I think that's in some ways different, say, from the intelligence failure, thinking about going into Iraq um, and, and how things went wrong there. Um, after, after things went wrong in Iraq, there were a lot of people around saying, I told you so, that they'd written up big books about how things were going to go off the rails um, once we tried to occupy Iraq. Um, I haven't myself heard anyone come out of the woodwork to say, I told you so, um, with, regard to, uh, with regard to the collapse of the, um, uh, the Afghan government. And that, to me, suggests that it really was surprising to pretty much everybody. Um, which honestly is surprising that it's, as, as Pete said, it's shocking to me that it shocked them, um, both because of the, um, uh, both because of uh, the sort of obvious limitations of, uh, of the um, having ammunition, but also as, as Pete mentioned, and as Scott is an, is an expert as in the history of, um, uh, of Afghan politics, that I would think that, uh, that, that they should have seen it. So I'd be curious to know, Scott, whether you feel like this fits in with patterns of some of the the previous invasions, whether we're talking Soviet or British or well, you don't do, you're, you don't you don't do up you don't do the Soviets, right? You stop in seventy <laughs> three. Well, uh, as in response to the the um, uh, viewer's question, uh, unfortunately, not enough of our leaders are, are reading Afghan history, but here at Ohio State, I'm happy to say we are teaching it. We, we've got a course in Afghan history going right now, uh, and we've been teaching it since uh, shortly after I got here in 2008. Uh, there's, um, uh, it's often credited to, to Mark Twain, I don't know whether that's true or not, uh, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And there certainly are similarities uh, that we see today on the ground that are aligned with the experiences. You know, there were three Anglo-Afghan wars, really the experience of, experience of the first Anglo-Afghan war. And then of course, with the um, Soviet invasion, which lasted just a little longer than nine years, starting on Christmas Eve, 1979. And one of the greatest similarities I'll see, and, and it, it, I'll, I'll point out is um, the ability of outside interests to inject their own resources and their own interests into the Afghan playing field. Uh, so in uh, it was 19, or sorry, 1839 to 1842 was the first Anglo-Afghan war. Uh, at that point in time, the Brits were able to go in, occupy Kabul, claim victory. Uh, and they held victory for, for a little while until outside resources started to um, uh, exert their own interests in, in Afghanistan. And that victory started to become really very shaky. And then in the end, there was a terrible withdrawal in, uh, in, in uh, 1842, the Death March, uh, where they say there was only one, uh, Dr. Bryden was the, the, the well, it may be mythological, but only one survivor of the, the march as the, um, uh, the British encampment was, uh, was emptied out of Kabul and made their way to, to, to Jalalabad, uh, where the Afghans united. They were divided among themselves, but they united against the Brits. We see that again in the 1980s, where um, the Afghans divided against themselves, united against the Soviets. And of course, in the 1980s, there you're talking about, uh, this is Operation Cyclone, uh, or better known today, of course, as Charlie Wilson's War. Uh, it's a great movie if, if you haven't seen it. Um, uh, and um, uh, there, the United States was one of those outside interests where we injected an enormous amount of wealth. It started pretty modestly, just a few hundred thousand dollars a year in, in, in 79, uh, or shortly after in, in early 1980. Uh, but then by the time we got to 1987, we were pumping hundreds of millions of dollars worth of resources. Uh, and that includes largely you know, military equipment, uh, anti-aircraft guns, all sorts of things, Stinger missiles going, going into Afghanistan. And so the Soviets weren't able to hold it. Uh, and these 
various interests across the country, again, united against that outside aggressor. And here for us, we've seen much the same. The question, of course, is where are those resources coming from? We know that many resources are coming from uh, local level uh, Islamic groups who are um, uh, interested in supporting the Taliban for their own particular re religious objectives. Others are coming from uh, more well-funded groups in the Gulf. And there's uh, substantial evidence to suggest that other national groups as well who uh, are saying, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so they would rather support the Taliban than the United States uh, or if it's gonna undermine our, our interests in the country. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop there and just say, yeah, um, there are some, some very, very important lessons to be learned from history. And we do not appear to have learned those lessons very well. Of course, a, a lot of the weapons uh, used to defeat uh, the United States and its Afghan allies in Afghanistan came from Washington. Uh, yeah. the, the former head of the Inter Services Intelligence Agency in Pakistan was waxing eloquent uh, after Kabul fell and uh, he was, I guess, at his lake villa or whatever, and he said to a reporter, you know, I'm the only person in the world who can say that I used American money to defeat the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, and I used American money to defeat the United States in Afghanistan. Um, <clears throat> next, this is, our, this is our ally speaking, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Frenemy, frenemy, frenemy. Um, next question. What is the uh, what uh, is the motivation of of Pakistan in all of this? This is very puzzling to American audiences. What Pakistan is up to, in uh, yeah, period. I I'll take that one on. So if you look at the history of Pakistan, its major enemy is India, and um, it believes that. Afghanistan is an Indian plot to surround Pakistan. And so it, the golden age of Pakistani security was when the Taliban was in charge of Afghanistan because the Taliban was an ally. And <clears throat> as soon as we toppled the Taliban, India came in and created like five or six consulates around Afghanistan. And again, it, it engendered fears in uh, Islamabad that India was surrounding it again. And so the Inter Services Intelligence Agency was supporting the Taliban and its associated uh, terrorist groups like the Haqqani Network in order to create that strategic depth again to its West. And I'm sure they're high-fiving each other in Islamabad today, having done that. Um, however, as one of the questions uh, alludes to, I'm not sure that the, the um, Pakistanis know what they've actually done. Uh, because they've also could have created the opportunity for the Pakistan Taliban right. to have a sanctuary now to attack Pakistan, just the way it occurred in Syria when Syria allowed the jihadists to come through to attack us in Iraq, and then it ended up blowing back on the Assad regime uh, a few years later. Uh, there's, I think there's a real parallel there between the kinds of um, sort of precarious diplomatic position that the, the Pakistani government is in is in continually, right, where they're playing this uh, balancing game between wanting, um, you know, Western, uh, particularly American military support and so on, but also wanting to use um, uh, alliances with extremist groups like the Taliban um, to keep themselves safe, but those same groups are actually a threat to themselves as, uh, and so, and in Saudi Arabia, the Saudi government is in a very similar kind of position, right? Where they want uh, they want resources and support from the United States, but they also need to use um, extremist groups uh, uh, for their own purposes. But they need to get American resources to make sure that those extremist groups don't kill them. And so, yeah, the 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 um, the the uh, Pakistani government uh, government. Um, you know, loves loves the Taliban in Afghanistan and hates them in Pakistan. So that's a pretty um, that's a pretty tricky line to to walk. Um, I'll come back to the question of learning. Why? What is there anything systematic or a set of explanations for why the U.S. took so long to come to the position it took? 
uh, and uh, is that lack, we've seen that before. What, what is going on? Because when you look at it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, want to start, um, Chris? Could you clarify, uh, having come to the conclusion that the war was unwinnable or? Uh, unwinnable, yes. Uh, <laughs> that it was unwinnable and that our mission had drifted. I mean, I think, you know, again, there are a lot of parallels here to Vietnam, right? Where it was clear that things were not going to go well in Vietnam uh, for many, um, uh, for many years uh, uh, before um, we, we actually got out. Um, I think we are able to stay longer in Afghanistan. So, so the fundamental answer, I think, is that no president wanted to be the one who lost Afghanistan on their watch, right? Um, and we were able to last longer in Afghanistan than we did in, uh, in Vietnam because we were suffering casualties at a lower rate in Afghanistan. And so um, that was more politically tolerable. Um, but um, uh, I mean, I think one thing, one sort of puzzle, one thing, and I'd be curious to know what, whether Pete has thoughts about this, because one moment that was really puzzling to me, because you had this you know, this strong motivation of, I don't want to be the president who lost Afghanistan. Um, but Obama had a real chance to get out and to not be that president. Um, the, the, the day after we killed Osama bin Laden, he could have walked into, uh, you walked up to the podium and said, mission accomplished for real this time. Um, we got Osama bin Laden uh, and, you know, that was our mission and we're getting out. Um, and it's very, very puzzling to me that he didn't find a way to do that because I know that the, um, you know, initially when he came in, he wanted to try the surge, uh, the surge sort of strategy in Afghanistan that it, that it had, that Pete had actually uh, had some success with um, in Iraq. Um, but by 2011, it was pretty clear that, that was not going to work. Um, so why the, the biggest puzzle, so in general, Nobody wants to lose this war. Obama had a chance to walk out a winner, and he didn't. And I, I honestly don't understand it. I don't know, Pete, if you have any thoughts about why that happened. Well, I, I think it's because there were other people, whether you call them the, the foreign policy blob or the military blob or whatever, that had a different vision for Afghanistan. Um, you know, President Bush used to say this uh, of Iraq, that in the future it needs to look like South Korea. Uh, South Korea you know, we've been there for 70 years. We have 28,000 troops stationed on the peninsula. And there have been casualties among those troops over the years. But we, the American people, um, are fine uh, with having that many troops over there in East Asia, creates stability. <clears throat> the government of South Korea was a dictatorship for many decades and uh, eventually uh, became a, a vibrant democracy and a vibrant, with a vibrant uh, economy. And um, so this, is, this was his vision. And that was the vision uh, for Afghanistan as well. If we could keep a modest amount of US troops over there and fund uh, the Afghan government uh, with you know, $20 billion, $30 billion a year, which is a lot, but it's kind of a drop in the bucket of DOD's budget, we could uh, maintain a. Um, you know, an Afghan government that was an ally in the war on terror. Uh, we would have those bases there in Central Asia to suppress ISIS-K and other terrorist groups. And over time, we could develop an Afghanistan um, that was uh, would be a, a better place for its people. Uh, that's what, you know, that's the other side of, of the coin. Uh, unfortunately, the United States lacked the will to do that, to stay there even though the casualties had gone to almost zero by the end. Uh, the American people, I don't think they were tired of the Afghan war, they were tired of hearing about it because most of the American people hadn't sacrificed anything uh, in Afghanistan uh, with only about 1% of the population serving in uniform and fewer than that actually serving in Afghanistan itself. Uh, to what extent is the US, US interest hurt by the lack of a military or physical presence in Afghanistan now? 
Well, we've lost our bases. Um, so intelligence on terrorist groups in Central Asia is going to be hard to come by now. Um, you know, they, they, the Biden administration has talked about this over the horizon capability to strike ISIS-K targets. Uh, don't believe it. I mean, we're talking about drones that have to take off from bases in the Gulf. Uh, by the time they get over Afghanistan, they have limited on station time. And unless they know exactly what they're going to hit, we've lost that ability to constantly loiter over the region and, um, and gain intelligence and strike targets at the time and place of our choosing. Uh, so there, I think Afghanistan is going to become somewhat of a black hole to us. And really, it's going to be up to the Taliban uh, to suppress ISIS-K. And there's no love lost between those two groups as uh, ISIS-K wants a caliphate and Taliban want a government. Well, the Taliban have a government. ISIS-K doesn't have a caliphate. So they would have to topple the Taliban to achieve their goals. <clears throat> I would I would agree with Pete, although I might put I might be a little more skeptical about how much we lose because I do I am skeptical of the sort of over the horizon capability, and so we do lose some, as as uh, as he said, some intelligence there. On the other hand, I'm maybe a little bit more skeptical about how good our intelligence was there to begin with, or how much that was really <laughs> helping us. I mean, given given how little we were able to anticipate, how quickly. Um, you know the the government fell and so on. So yes, I think our our intelligence will get worse in Afghanistan, but I'm not sure it was very very good anyway. So um, and it might not matter. Um, there, there's right. plenty of other places in the world for terrorists to operate from these days. If you look at the 9/11 attacks, they were really planned in Hamburg, Germany. So I'm not sure how how valuable a base in the mountains of eastern Afghanistan is going to be to Al Qaeda or ISIS K in the future. Um, there are a, a couple of questions about military equipment. Um, how much was left? Um, what, what could have been done about it? Uh, how significant it is? I guess one question I have is when the U.S. is left places, does the military engage in a systematic effect, a systematic effort to destroy uh, the most important equipment? It does, uh, if that equipment belongs to us. Most of the equipment that the uh, Taliban captured belonged to um, the Afghan security forces. We're not, as they were fighting, we weren't going to take their equipment away and either evacuate it or destroy it. So it was only at the very end that we had that capability in a very limited way. We destroyed some of the aircraft that were on the Kabul airfield. Um, it, it, this is really not a big deal. Uh, we left behind even more equipment in Vietnam when Vietnam fell. And um, the North Vietnamese, or now the Vietnamese, have used that for, you know, they used that for years and decades afterwards um, in their wars with China, in, in their invasion of Cambodia. But I don't see the Taliban trying to attack a neighboring state. So they'll be well armed and well equipped with uh, US weapons and vehicles and so forth. But to, to what end? Um, you know, if they can use it to suppress ISIS-K, you know, that's great. But it's not like the Taliban is on the march to the next uh, neighboring state. Um, what, um, what is the likelihood of the United States reintroducing troops in the future? Do either of you see it at all likely? How likely? Uh, it's not likely at all. Uh, there's no stomach in the American populace for uh, war in Afghanistan again. So um, I think you can scratch that one off the possibilities list. Chris? Yeah, I would definitely agree for the foreseeable future. I, I can't, I, I just can't imagine um, uh, a, a president you know, whether it's Biden or whoever comes next, um, saying that we're going to go get back in Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, I, that just seems like that would be so, I mean, you know, I, I agree with um, Pete that, that we, we had reduced the casualty rate in Afghanistan to be quite low, but the war was still quite unpopular. Um, now, because 
there weren't as many people getting killed, it, it didn't, and, and because there wasn't a political party mobilizing around this issue, it didn't become a big issue in, uh, in partisan politics and so on. But, but the, the war in Afghanistan was unpopular. It had been unpopular with the American public for, for quite a number of years. And so um, I, I think we will not see us go back there again anytime soon. Um, uh, uh, what would have happened if the U.S. had delayed uh, beyond September 11th? Would the U.S. have had to introduce combat troops? Would the Taliban have uh, begun to wage war against us? Uh, that's, that's something I've heard talked about as a constraint of the Biden administration. Is there anything to that? Yeah, the, the Taliban were clear that they they would not attack American troops unless we overstayed the deadline for our withdrawal, and then they would. And they, those troops were very vulnerable being located just in one place in, in Kabul. So they would have been very, very vulnerable to mortar and artillery fire. Um, it would not have been good. So in that sense, President Biden made the right decision not to overstay our welcome. Chris? Um. Yeah, I mean, I. Uh, yeah, I basically, I, I, I think Pete's right, um, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I have a lot to add to that. I think that's basically yeah. Um, nation building. Um, question about nation building. Uh, its plausibility. Um, and then the role of corruption. Uh, how, how significant was corruption in the ability of the Afghanistani government to take hold and the military to fight? I mean, my sense is that corruption was a really critical problem from the beginning, going back to what both Pete and I were saying about not having a reliable partner. That's a lot of what not all, but that's a lot of what not having a reliable partner was. I mean, we poured um, billions, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars into Afghanistan, much of which just literally disappeared. Um, and uh, I also think, um, you know, you think about the the collapse of the government right at the end and fleeing, you know, the, the president fleeing the country with a bunch of money. And, uh, and that, that I think reflects the same kind of, you know, um, that that uh, that the the United States and the resources of the United States in that country were constantly sought after um, as a uh, as a resource to fight for, not not to not to uh, help win the war, but to sort of line your own pockets. I don't know, Pete, would you agree with that? You know, someone once told me that in the United States, you need money to gain power. And in the third world, you need power to get money. <laughs> and I think Afghanistan is, uh, is an example of that. There were a lot of people lining their pockets um, in it for themselves or in it for their tribe or for their family group or whatever. Uh, there really wasn't, I don't know, maybe Scott could speak to whether there is a sense of Afghan identity. Maybe there was at one point, but uh, civil war since 1978 seems to have uh, destroyed it, except as uh, except for the Taliban, which, you know, and their identity is different. It's a, a very much an Islamic identity. So, um, yeah, corruption was huge, but really in the sense that to win this war, we needed a, a government in Kabul that could be a government for all Afghans, and it never proved that it could be. And so it never got that support from the populace that you, counterinsurgents so desperately need. To a slightly different uh, angle, discuss current Russian and Chinese interest and in strategies in the region uh, and what they portend for the U.S. for the U.S. withdrawal. Um, well, they, they wanted the U.S. out, so that's one. Uh, Afghanistan can become part of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, right. um, and there are mineral de 
minerals in supposedly in Afghanistan. There's some studies that there's a lot of mineral deposits there that Chinese companies could then take advantage of. Uh, for the Russians, you know, their concern in this in their southern region is really the the drift of terrorism, Islamic terrorism north into Russia and into the, the neighboring countries. So they have a, ironically, they have a counter-terror consideration in, in Afghanistan as well. Uh, but I think Russia was looking at Afghanistan a lot like the United States was looking at Afghanistan in the 1980s, and that is a way to get back, get at yeah. its strategic competitor and bleed it. Yeah, it, it, the, the, the Russian case is really interesting because a lot of, in a lot of ways we do have similar interests to Russia, but it shows how much they want to stick it to us that they're willing to, <laughs> that they're willing to support the terrorists there because they'd rather, um, you know, do damage to the United States, even if it, uh, e even if it puts themselves at risk. That's how bad Putin wants to stick it to the United States. Um, Congratulations, Vladimir! You won. Now, now you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. How likely is the Taliban uh, to be able to govern Iraq? Will they be able to to function as a, a viable government? Well, they functioned as a viable government in the 1990s through a lot of uh, sheer terror, and they're instituting some of those same thing, punishments uh, again. Uh, the problem is the economy is on the verge of collapse. Uh, you have a, a more educated population that when they begin to starve, they may not be so forthcoming to the Taliban as they were in the 1990s. Um, you know, the, the Taliban has gained, will gain diplomatic recognition from China and Russia, no doubt. But the United States and the West is really who the Taliban need uh, to support them because we have the non-governmental organizations and the, the funds to help in a humanitarian capacity. Uh, we've agreed to do so recently in, in talks in Doha to provide some humanitarian assistance, but we're not gonna provide much until the Taliban uh, are more forthcoming on the sorts of equities that, uh, that the West wants to see, such as, uh, women's rights and rights of minorities to be part of uh, an inclusive Afghanistan. That's going to be really, that's going to be a hard lift for the Taliban. That's not who they are, even though they, they kind of are saying the right things right now. You know, when you look at what they've done, uh, they've created a government that's almost all Taliban, very few outsiders in it. So, you know, we'll see. Chris? Chris? I agree. I, I, I mean, I think Taliban and Scott may be able to speak to this um, uh, it, from a more historical perspective. Uh, Taliban has had uh, a lot of governance problems. It's been a difficult space to govern um, for most of its history, as far as I understand. But uh, my understanding is that the Taliban has been more successful than most entities, um, you know, for better or for worse, in terms of actually uh, being able to be. Uh, a state presence uh, in local politics. I don't know, Scott, would you say hi historically they're, they're among the stronger sort of groups for, for being able to govern the space? Yeah, I, I, would, I would confirm that. I'd say that's true, uh, largely because they're able to appeal to people of uh, multiple different constituencies, different backgrounds. Uh, large, you know, primarily, of course, you've got the Pashto um, uh, ethnicity, which is the majority, um, the largest of the, the minorities in Afghanistan, but you've also got Uzbeks, Tajiks, Hazaras, Turkmen, and, and other groups. Um, the Taliban have also been really very successful at pulling uh, resources, pulling, drawing support from outside of the country. And that's really been driving their their support, uh, their their success. As we look back into the into the the, the 1990s, um, uh, that was that was critical. Uh, whereas the other groups, um, you know, even the Northern Alliance didn't have the the kind of a record of pulling support from outside that the the Taliban did. Um. What is the uh, takeaway from the last 20 years? What do we say to service members uh, and their families, people who have lost lives, who have suffered terrible 
injuries? Was it all for nothing? Uh, what, what, what did we say to them? Well, you did your, you did your duty. Uh, which is all we can ask of our men and women in uniform. Um, it doesn't always go the way you want it to, uh, and it certainly didn't in this case. Uh, but you can hold your head, he heads high. You've, you've done your service to the nation uh, to the best of your ability, and it really wasn't anything you did that caused the Afghan uh, war to end, end up the way it did. Um, it, it was really due to a lot of other factors we've discussed today. So, um, you know, I wouldn't say mission accomplished, but your mission was accomplished in the way each and every one of you did in, in your own individual way. So, you know, th think back to the comrades you've lost and those who are still with us and um, hold those bonds close as uh, only veterans can do. Yeah, yeah I am. Um... I mean, in some ways, I can't speak to this as well as Pete, because I, I haven't served in it and I'm I'm not a veteran, so I I can't as well, I think, imagine the kind of pain and uh, feeling of loss that, that they may be going through. Um, but I would say two things uh, in terms of whether, um, what le one thing about what lessons to learn and another about um, uh, whether it was uh, all in vain. Um, well, let me premise it by saying I agree 100% with everything that Pete said about um, this, about the members of the military feeling like they did their duty and they, 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 were, they served honorably for their country. Um, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of whether it was all in vain, I think we don't know the answer to that yet. It certainly was all in vain in terms of not um, taking Afghanistan. But it might not be all in vain if this time we could actually learn something from this event. As we talked about before, we, we've had many other instances where we should have learned this lesson already. This is another chance for America to learn these lessons about the limits of American power. Um, and so I think if, if we actually take this time to reflect on the costs and the suffering and the loss and try to learn that lesson, um, I think that will be... Uh, I think that will make it not in vain. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, uh, that that I would encourage that while, while it wasn't the fault of those who served and who paid the cost, it was the fault of those who chose to go and chose to stay. And so that we should uh, we should hold them accountable for what were uh, foreseeable unforced errors. Um, that cost so many lives. So hopefully, you know, if they if we can hold those people accountable and learn lessons, then maybe it's not for nothing. Perfect end note. I want to thank all of the uh, participants, Chris, Pete, and Scott, and the audience, and have a good afternoon. <laughs>